You know when you hear those songs? Those songs that just speak to you. Those songs that, that make you feel like you can conquer the world. And those songs that connect with you at your lowest points. Music is a powerful influence in our lives, and it has been for years. These are the original Songs of Summer. Hey, well, good morning and welcome to Northridge Church. We're so glad that you decided to take time out of your busy summer schedule to join us here this morning as we continue in our series called Songs of Summer, where we basically just take a flip through the Bible's record collection, the collection of songs and poems written by ancient Hebrew poets that we call the Book of Psalms. I know this series has been super helpful to me, and I hope it's been helpful to you guys as well. My name is Matt, and I'm one of our Henrietta Campus staffers. Shout out to the Hen fam. I love you guys. I miss you guys. I'll be back next week. Please try not to let Aaron push too many buttons while I'm gone. Please. I'm I'm serious. Don't. Yeah. Good. My wife, Sarah, and I, we came to Northridge about a year ago as one-year interns to help launch the Henrietta campus, and now I'm here full-time as the worship and production director down there. So my Sunday mornings are pretty crazy, but I wouldn't have it any other way. Speaking of my wife, Sarah and I actually just celebrated our two-year anniversary It's been awesome. We're officially no longer newlyweds, and depending on how long you've been married, that statement was really funny. Um, But so for our second anniversary, we decided to take a trip up to Toronto to just enjoy the city, spend time together, relax. And while we were there, I learned something really important, and that is that when you cross the border into Canada, you absolutely cannot forget that no one knows how to drive up there. It's horrible. Turns out, international problem, bad driving. It's really bad, specifically merging. I don't know what it is. Canadians cannot merge, which is crazy because if you know anything about how they've designed Toronto's highways, they've actually built them to like minimize the amount of points you have to merge, and they still manage to get it like horrifically wrong. It's terrible. You drive for two or three miles, sorry, four or five kilometers because it's Canada, and then you just like, as soon as there's a merge, you slow down to a stop, and then once you clear the merge point, you're back up to speed for another couple miles, and it's just repeat over and over. They can't merge. It's terrible. Bad driving is honestly like my biggest pet peeve in the world because you're putting your hands, your life in the hands of like 5,000 other people on 590, and they just don't seem as into it as you do, to be completely honest, and it's honestly the worst thing. But merging is one thing. My least favorite driving thing is when you get cut off, right? It's jarring. Your adrenaline shoots up and you spend like the next five minutes and you're like a twitchy mess while you wait for your body to get down off of red alert. It's honestly the worst. But what makes it even worse is when it's like a really nice car that cuts you off, right? It's one thing when it's the dinged up little Prius that runs in front of you, but when it's some dude in a Ferrari, it's just extra frustrating because it's like, dude, you can't drive and you're filthy rich. That's totally wrong. You shouldn't be able to have... You shouldn't be able to have a car that costs more than my house and not be able to drive it. It's just, it gets us on like a spiritual level. But I think that problem extends to more than just driving, doesn't it? We can't stand when people who we think are bad succeed in life, right? It's just something that's innately wired in us. A celebrity that immoral shouldn't be able to make that much money. A politician that corrupt shouldn't be able to hold that office. A doctor that messed up shouldn't be able to hurt that many kids. Someone that biased shouldn't be able to be in that position of power. But maybe for you, it's a little more personal than that. Maybe for you, that guy who cuts corners at work all the time just got that promotion that you were in line for. Or maybe you're struggling to make friends at school, and it seems like the kids who are popular are the ones who just can never follow the rules. Or maybe it's just that other mom who's just plain mean And everything in life always seems to break her way. See, it's one thing when a Lamborghini cuts you off in traffic, but that's small potatoes compared to how big this problem can actually get in life. Why does this bother us so much? Why does this get to us on such a deep level? Why can't we just write it off and and divorce people's character from their success? Why can't we just say, okay, forget what his family's like. The dude can play ball. It's okay. Or or forget what they post online, they get results. Why can't we do that? I think it's because there's something innately wired in us that recognizes that that isn't how the world is supposed to work. 
This isn't how things are supposed to go. In fact, I think the success of wicked people is one of the strongest indicators that I can think of that this world isn't the way it's supposed to be. It's a question we all deal with. It's an issue we all wrestle with. Why is this world so messed up? Why is this world so messed up? Why do good things happen to bad people? Maybe for you, it's why do bad things happen to good people? What in the world is going on in this world that's supposed to be under the care of a God who's all-powerful and all-good? It just doesn't seem to line up. And you know what? This is a serious question. And it's a question that's caused many people to walk away from God and walk away from faith. And you know what? It may be the question that caused you to walk away from God. And you know what? I think you're right. Because if I was in your shoes and I got given the same answers that you did, I probably would have made the same decision that you did. But I don't think it has to be this way. The thing is, I think this question, why is the world so messed up, I think it does have a good answer. In fact, I think it has two good answers, and I think that's really important. Because we struggle with this question on two different levels, and that requires two very different answers. First, there's the, the kind of intellectual side of the question, the philosophical, like, how does it actually logically work out that a God who's all good and all powerful can coexist with evil? How does that, like, actually work out intellectually? And there's an intellectual answer to that question. In fact, people have been writing about this problem for centuries, and they've been doing a much better job of it than I could today. So if that question interests you, if you want more information on this, on the way in, you should have gotten a program, and on the bottom of that is a connections card. There's a box on there that talks about signing up for the weekly equip email. If you want more information on this, if this is a question that you're struggling through, check that box, give us your email, and we will get those resources to you. But for the sake of time, I'm just going to give you a Reader's Digest version of the answer. Basically, it goes something like this, that an all-good, all-powerful God can allow evil, and in fact, in his goodness, he can have an all-good reason for allowing it. It solves that logical tension. It works out logically. It solves the intellectual problem. Seriously, if this interests you, check that box for that equip email. There's some incredible stuff out there. But for a lot of you, though, that answer that I just gave doesn't cut it. In fact, it may have really made you mad because you don't have an intellectual problem with this. You don't have some philosophical issue with this. You've got history. You've got pain. You've got problems. Children are starving. Your marriage is on the fritz. And you've got pain, and it's real, and it hurts. And the answer I just gave you doesn't help one bit because intellectual answers don't solve emotional questions. Intellectual answers don't solve emotional questions. And that can make things a little difficult for us. Because when we look to the Bible for answers, we often find intellectual answers. A good chunk of the Bible is what I like to call instruction. It's classroom material, it's information, it's teaching. And it's good, it's helpful, it's life-changing, but it's an intellectual answer. And it's not going to answer an emotional question. And this is where the Psalms come in. We've talked a lot this series about how the Psalms are basically just poems. They're songs and poetry that were written by ancient Hebrew poets. And they do what only poetry can do, and that's they put emotion into words. They give us the emotional answers to the emotional questions. So today I want to try to answer that question. Why is this world so messed up? And we're going to look at Psalm 73 in hopes of finding an emotional answer to that question. So if you would, open up your Bibles, whether you're using your tablet or your phone or you have one of our Bibles here. If you're using one of our Bibles, it's on page 469, Psalm 73. And this is one of my absolute favorite Psalms. I've liked it for a long time, but this Psalm really came alive to me when I was in college and one of my college pastors broke the passage down the way I'm about to today. It was incredible. And it really changed the way I think about pain and suffering in the world. But another reason that I love this psalm is because I find it incredibly easy to identify with the author of this psalm. If you look at your Bible, right under the actual words Psalm 73 is a little heading. And a lot of the psalms have these, and basically what they are is they're just background information. They may tell us who wrote the psalm or what was going on when the psalm was written or sometimes even like what tune the song was originally intended to be sung to. They just give us information. And these headings are actually original to the psalm. They're not something that we've added in later. In fact, some of your Bibles may actually have these headings listed as verse 1 of the psalm. 
they're really helpful things to look at as we study through the psalm. So the heading in Psalm 73 says that this particular psalm was written by a guy named Asaph. Right, Asaph. Isn't, isn't he the guy who wrote all those fables about animals like learning patience and stuff? No, that's Aesop. He was Greek. This guy's Hebrew and his name's Asaph. And other places in the Bible tell us that Asaph and his family were the resident musicians in the temple. Basically, they were the staff musicians where people came to worship together. Now, that immediately connects with me because that's kind of sort of basically exactly what my job is, but I think it connects with all of us a little more broadly because despite the fact that Asaph would have been a pretty visible person around the temple, he was a pretty average dude. Like, think about who comes to mind when we think about the authors of the Psalms. King Solomon wrote a bunch of psalms, and he's routinely described as being the wisest and richest man to ever live on this planet. Moses wrote a couple, and if we're honest, he's basically a superhero. He did some incredible things when God used him to rescue the people of Israel from Egypt. And then King David wrote about half of the psalms, and he's described as a man after God's own heart. And he was picked to be king when he was a child. These are great, but not exactly the easiest group of people to relate to, am I right? For example, one of David's psalms, one of those psalms says that it was written while David was hiding in a cave while King Saul tried to kill him. So let's, let's wrap your minds around that. The future king of Israel is hiding in a cave from the current king of Israel because the current king of Israel is crazy and wants to kill the future king of Israel because God said that he was going to be king instead of his son. I mean, who hasn't been there, am I right? Exactly. See, now these psalms are great. They're helpful. They give us an insider look into the lengths that God goes to make good on his promises. We get a front row seat into God showing off his power. But if we're honest, sometimes that's a little out there. Like, I don't, I don't have king problems. I have normal people problems. And so it's really hard for us to relate to those guys. That's what I love about Asaph. He doesn't come with any of that baggage. The Bible doesn't tell us about his valor in battle or like any miracles that he did. He's literally described as a dude who can sing. And I think we can all relate to that, even if you're a dude who can't sing. But I think that perhaps even more important than that, while Asaph is an everyday dude, he's also a guy who we would assume is probably in a pretty good place with God. After all, he's on staff at the temple. He's up in front of hundreds, if not thousands of people every day leading people in worship. And yet, look at how he starts off this psalm. Psalm 73, verse 1. He says, Surely the Lord is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold. Now, that's not, that's not exactly the kind of sentiment, sentiment you'd expect to hear from temple staff, right? He says, Surely God is good to Israel. I've got the intellectual answer. I know this. But personally, as for me, I didn't see it. I was ready to give up. I was ready to throw in the towel and walk away. Now, no need to raise your hand or anything, but how many of us have been there at some point? I think that's a place that we've probably all been at some point in our lives. But like, really? Asaph? You, dude? You're like the man. No way. Get this. Asaph's a church guy who still struggles with these kind of questions. Asaph's an on-the-platform guy who's still apparently putting in some serious hours wrestling with God. And this is so freeing to me because it gives me permission to wrestle through these things too. See, I think it's incredibly easy for us to get to this place where we feel like as we grow in our Christian walk and as we log more and more miles on our Christian frequent flyer card, so to speak, eventually we're going to get to this point where we reach this kind of like nirvana, where we never struggle with these kind of questions anymore. That'd be awesome if it were the case, but that's simply not how it works. Just ask anyone you see up here on a Sunday morning. Ask Drew. Ask your campus pastor. Ask the worship team at your campus. We all have seasons when we face these questions. And the problem with that thinking is that it drives us to one of two places. We either become really discouraged that we haven't hit the mark yet. We're still like JV Christians because we still struggle with these kind of questions. Or, on the other hand, we become incredibly fake because we don't want anyone around us to know that we still struggle with these kind of questions. And neither of those things is helpful. 
And one of the things I love about this psalm is that it absolutely blows that thinking out of the water. Because Asaph is one of the guys on the temple staff, and here he is still struggling with these things. He literally worked in the building where the presence of God dwelt on earth, and he's still putting in time wrestling with God. And so I think if it's okay for him to wrestle, it's okay for me too. And the cool thing is Asaph didn't just wrestle with God. He wrote it down. He wrote a song about it. So we can look at what he went through and find those emotional answers to these questions that we've been asking. We know intellectually that God is good and that he's going to make everything right and that he's got our best interests in mind, but that kind of doesn't help right now. So what do we do in the meantime? What's that emotional answer? And in this passage, Asaph basically sets up this point, and it's kind of the big idea for today, that attention drives emotion. Our attention drives our emotion. So we need to look at what we're looking at, because how we feel, our emotions are frequently a result of our perspective. Our attention drives our emotion, and Asaph kind of uses himself as a case study for this to show us how this principle plays out. You see, there are three very basic places that we can put our attention in the world. Two of them ultimately don't prove to be very good options, but Asaph goes through all three of them and shows us the results of them, and I want to do the same thing today. So when we're faced with the brokenness in the world, when things don't seem to be going our way, when things seem to be going right for all the wrong people and wrong for all the right people, the first place we can put our attention is on what's around us. We can look around we can look around. And Asaph did this, and let's see what he has to say about it. Notice all of the they's that show up in this passage as he looks around at the people around him and sees what's going on. Verse 3, he says, for I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They are free from common human burdens. They are not plagued by human ills. He basically says, They've got no trouble in the world. They're healthy, tofu eating, core life every meal, gym tan laundry every day. They've got gardeners. They've got drivers. Every time they roll the dice, it comes up seven or whatever dice are supposed to come up. Not that I would know. (laughs) They don't have a care in the world. He goes on in verse six. Therefore, pride is their necklace. They clothe themselves with violence. From their callous hearts come iniquity. Their evil imaginations have no limits. They scoff and they speak with malice. With arrogance, they threaten oppression. Their mouths lay claim to heaven and their tongues take possession of the earth. These are not nice people here. They're prideful. They're arrogant. They're violent. Their words hurt people. Their actions hurt people. And they use their positions of power to oppress those around them. Verse 10. He says, therefore, their people turn to them and drink up waters in abundance. They say, how would God know? Does the Most High know anything? What's more, it's not just these people. The people around them are starting to look at the success of these wicked people and say, well, God clearly must not be in the picture, so I'm just going to go with these guys. It's It's contagious. It's starting to spread to the people around him. It's not a great picture that Asaph's painting here. He kind of sums it up in verse 12. He says, this is what the wicked are like. Always free of care, they go on amassing wealth. Not a care in the world, raking in the money. I wonder if you've been there. Have you ever looked around and said, God, this this just doesn't seem fair? See, our attention drives our emotion, and Asaph's attention here is on what's happening around him. And if all we ever do is focus on the brokenness in the world around us, and the mess that's going on around us, we're going to be distressed too. But Asaph doesn't, he doesn't stop there. He turns his attention to a second place. See, we can look around at what's going on around us in the world, or we can also look within. We can look at ourselves and look at our lives and look within. Notice all the eyes that show up in this next set of verses. He says, surely in vain, I have kept my heart pure. And I've washed my hands in innocence. All day long I have been afflicted, and every morning brings new punishments. If I had spoken out like that, I would have betrayed your children. He says, God, it's it's one thing when the wicked are winning, but it's another thing when I'm losing. You almost like hear the frustration in his voice. He says, God, I've held up my end of the deal and I'm still suffering over here. What's going on? You just see the angst coming out of him. He says, I've been good. I've done things right. And now, I'll be honest, I have to wonder if that's all been in vain, God, because it's clearly not getting me anywhere. 
he's looked within and he's broken over it. See, if all we do is look within, if all we do is put our attention on ourselves and our situation, and remember, our attention drives our emotion. If all we do is look within, especially when life isn't going well for us, we're going to wind up distressed. And Asaph kind of sums all this up in verse 16. He says, when I tried to understand this, it troubled me deeply. At this point, he, he comes to a turning point. He's looked around, he's seen the wicked prospering, and it's frustrated him. He's looked within, he's seen the mess in his own life, and it's broken him. He's empty, distressed, and he's ready to call it quits until. This troubled me deeply until I entered the sanctuary of God. He says, then I understood their final destiny. He says, this made no sense to me until I entered God's presence. This made no sense to me until I began to worship. This made no sense to me until I made the conscious decision to take my attention off of what's happening around me, what's going on in my own life, and put it on to God. It made no sense until I made the decision to look up. See, we can look around us and we can put our attention on what's around. We can look within or we can choose to put our attention on God. And while that may seem almost impossibly simple, the reality is that sometimes the difference between peace and trouble is having the right perspective. Sometimes the difference between peace and trouble is just having the right perspective. It's seeing the world the way that God sees it. It's a lot, it's a lot like these. They're 3D glasses. Now, I don't know about the rest of you, but every time I go to a 3D movie, I have this thing that I have to do. It's like an like unavoidable compulsion that at some point during the movie, I have to take the glasses off and see what's going on. I think it may just be like my innate desire to be like, okay, I paid like four extra dollars for this movie. I want to make sure something's actually happening. But what happens when you take the glasses off? The screen gets all blurry. The colors get all trippy. Things don't make sense anymore. It's Honestly, if you do it long enough, you get a headache. It's really not a great decision to do for a long period of time. But what happens when you put the glasses back on? As soon as you put the glasses back on, it's clear it's vivid. Mr. Incredible's fist is like inches from your face. It's awesome, all because you have the right perspective. So how do we do this? What does it mean for us to enter the sanctuary, to look up to God? I think Asaph explains that for us in Psalm, in verse 28. He says, but as for me, it is good to be near God. I've made the sovereign Lord my refuge, and I will tell of all your deeds. He basically gives us three steps that we can take here. The first is that we need to get close to God. He says it's good to be near God. We need to get close to God. For some of you, that may mean taking that Bible off the shelf for the first time in a long time. We just started this new reading plan in this summer through the Psalms. I'd encourage you, jump into that. For others of you, that may mean making Sunday mornings more of a priority in your life may mean prioritizing being out here over being on the lake this summer. Get close to God. Second, make God your refuge. Is God the place that you run to when things get tough? Or do you go somewhere else first? How quickly, when, when things get bad in your life, how quickly do you turn to prayer? Is it your first resort or is it one of the last things that you go to? I know for me, it certainly isn't quickly enough. We need to make God our refuge. Prayer shouldn't be our first response in trouble. It should be our first response in trouble, not our last-ditch effort. And then lastly, Asaph says to tell of his deeds. He says to tell your story of what God has done in your life. Has God proven himself to be faithful to you in the past? Have you gone through the ups and downs of life and found on the back end that God is still with you and that God is still faithful? Tell your story. Tell your story that God is faithful through cancer, through miscarriages, through financial hardship, through suffering, through loneliness. Your story, your story that God is faithful through the storm may be what brings peace to someone in their storm. Tell your story. Get close to God, make God your refuge, and tell of his deeds. And when Asaph puts his attention on God, it changes everything. This is where he finds his perspective. But what exactly is it that he finds? He tells us in verse 18, Surely you place them on slippery ground. You cast them down to ruin. How suddenly are they destroyed? 
completely swept away by terrors. They are like a dream when one awakes. When you arise, Lord, you will despise them as fantasies. Asaph moves his focus on to God, and he recognizes the brevity and the uncertainty of this life. That life is incredibly short. See, the, the wicked, their life seems to be going great until the test result comes back. Their life's going just fine until someone runs a stop sign. Life is so short. In fact, the book of Ecclesiastes, it's another highly poetic book in the Bible, describes life as being like a vapor, a mist. It's here and then it's gone. It's like a, like a squirt from a Febreze bottle. It's just phew, gone. Asaph enters into God's presence. He, he puts his attention on to God and his emotions, which are driven by his attention, clear up. Perhaps the, the best way I can illustrate this is with the story of Ariadna Gutierrez. See, in 2015, Ariadna survived rounds and rounds of intense competition and judging to be crowned Miss Universe 2015. And as she's taken her victory lap, or whatever they call it in the pageant world, the host of the pageant, Steve Harvey, comes out on stage and announces that there's been a mistake. You all know what happens next. Steve says that he read his cue card wrong and that, in fact, Ariadna wasn't Miss Universe 2015. Miss Philippines was. And what followed this was what has been described as the most awkward four minutes in television history when that mistake was publicly corrected on live television. It's like, uh, hey, yeah, that, <laughs> that crown, um, we're, yeah, yeah, we're, we're going to need that back. Um, uh, yeah, the, the sash, t actually, we're, we're going to need all of it back. Sorry. It was really, really awkward. Ariadna Gutierrez wore the crown as Miss Universe for exactly four minutes. For 240 seconds, she was Miss Universe. And then it was taken from her and given to someone else. And my question for you is this. Would you rather be Miss Universe number one or Miss Universe number two. Maybe that's not the best illustration. Maybe you don't want to be either, but I think you see where I'm going with this. Would you rather wear the crown for 240 seconds or for forever? Because when you take this life, all its joys and pains, and you compare them to eternity, that's what you get. You see, friends, this life is short, but eternity is long, and the choices that we make have the ability to affect our eternity. See, if our attention does drive our emotion, we need to keep our attention on what matters most. See, the Bible teaches that there is a literal heaven and a literal hell, and that every one of us is going to spend our eternity in one of those two places. And the only thing that determines where you will spend your eternity is your relationship with Jesus, your belief in Jesus, if he is who he says he is. It's that relationship that's going to make all the difference. See, for the believer... The brief pains of this world are the closest you'll ever get to hell. But for the unbeliever, the greatest pleasure of this world is the closest that you'll ever get to heaven. And I don't want to minimize the pain you're going through. I don't want to be that guy that comes up here and tells you that whatever it is that you're struggling with is actually this small little problem that you shouldn't worry about anymore. Because that wouldn't be honest and that wouldn't be fair to you. But what I do want to do is give you hope. I want to give you hope that even if this life never seems to go your way, even if nothing pulls together in this life for you, you can still experience immeasurable joy that will far outweigh anything that you could have ever experienced on this earth. Don't take my word for it, though. It's, it's pretty easy for me to say this. I'll be the first to admit my life has gone pretty well up until this point. I've had some hard times, sure. In fact, I'm in the middle of some of them right now. But don't take my word for it. In 2 Corinthians 4.17, the Apostle Paul says this. He says, This light momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. If you know anything about the Apostle Paul, you'll know that his life was not easy. You name the trouble, the guy went through it. Stoned to death, didn't work, beaten, shipwrecked, you name it, that guy went through it. He's had incredible hardship in this life, and apparently his understanding of God is big enough that he could look at heaven and look at eternity and say, in comparison, what I'm going through right now, it's okay. It's not a big deal, because God's got bigger things in store for me. See, this isn't a matter of minimizing your pain. 
In fact, it's, it's the opposite. It's about maximizing your view of God so that your understanding of the joy that he has for you in heaven outweighs anything that you can experience in this life. And I'm going to tell you guys, it's not even close. If I could boil it all down to a single statement, it'd be this. If you miss heaven, you've missed it all. If you miss heaven, you've missed it all. You can experience great things in this life, but if you miss heaven, you've missed it all. Our attention drives our emotion. And see, we can choose to look around for answers. We can look within for those answers, or we can make the decision to put our focus on to God and on to eternity and on to what truly matters. And that makes all the difference. Would you pray with me? Father, we live in a messed up world. And God, until you come back, it's probably still going to be a messed up world. But in the meantime, allow us to be people who make the decision to put our attention on to you to put our focus on to you and to what you have for us. God, we love you and thank you. Thank you so much for Jesus who died, who gave his life to make eternity with you possible. Father, we're looking forward to heaven. We just ask that you would be with us as we make these steps today. We love you and thank you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.